Welcome everyone to the October 23rd City Council work session. Um, glad to be having this discussion today because this is part of the um, work of our uh, climate and energy plan. It's part of the one of the clusters that we're looking at for economic development among many other things. So it's a really, um, I think, significant and important issue in our community. I'll turn it over to you, City Manager. Thanks, Mayor. It also relates to uh, Envision Eugene and land use as well as some other kinds of things as well. So I'll turn over to Babe and lead us in a conversation. Great, thank you. Babe O'Sullivan, Sustainability Liaison with the City Manager's Office. I'm just going to take a few minutes this, or this afternoon to um, set the context for your conversation by giving you a broad overview of urban agriculture and sustainable food systems. And then I'll be turning it over to Councillor Evans to carry on from there. Babe, before you get started, can you move the microphone a little bit closer to you, please? Thank I you. did hear we a have a dying uh, battery. Um, issue with our my mics so just so you know okay go ahead <laughs> thank you <laughs> speak right up no pressure so i'll direct your attention to the screen because i'm going to run you through a, a brief powerpoint to um, give you this background information for the conversation so um, i want to highlight regional activities and partners there's lots there to talk about review related city policy and focus on the innovation and best practices uh, that are enhancing our local uh, food system. But before I do that, I thought it might be helpful to provide just a couple of definitions. Uh, when we talk about urban agriculture, generally what we're referring to is growing and raising food crops and animals in an urban setting for the purpose of feeding local populations. And food systems uh, generally uh, refers to the activities that connect food production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste management. So it's the full life cycle of food when we speak about food systems. And what makes a sustainable food system, I think we're discovering that, but some of the things um, that I would point to are those that reflect a triple bottom line approach that addresses environmental, economic, and social equity considerations. So some of the dimensions of a sustainable food system uh, might be access to healthy, affordable food, a strong, integrated local food economy, and environmental, environmentally friendly production and processing practices that contribute to a resilient food system. So those are just some potential dimensions of a sustainable food system. I'm going to focus most of my comments today on activities that are going on within the city of Eugene, but I want to recognize all the other regional partners that make a significant contribution and then there are many. These are just a few of them. We've got a broad set of organizations addressing food system issues here in our region uh, with a complex network of activities, goals, and accomplishments, many of which you're probably familiar with. This is just a sample of some of those and we have some folks representing them here with us today. So let's dig into the policy piece first. Some of that was contained in your um, agenda item summary, but uh, let's go through those in a little more detail. As John mentioned, uh, Envision Eugene is an important part of our policy framework that informs our food system. At its most basic, the state land use um, law is designed to promote compact urban um, areas and preserve the outlying forests high value ag land and other natural resources. So the, the fundamental approach to land use planning in our state is designed to preserve um, that uh, agricultural uh, resource. How we see it manifest here is with the urban growth boundary that acts as an interface between that dense urban development and the outlying agricultural uh, uses and it helps to define what that interface looks like. It also limits the scope and magnitude of urban food production. As we grow denser within that UGB, we're more limited with what we can achieve in terms of uh, urban food production. That being said, within the Envision Eugene framework, there's recognition that homegrown food supports our local food security. And so the Envision Eugene recommendation also calls for removing barriers to urban agriculture and specifically looking at things at the residential scale like backyard and community gardens, urban food orchards, and micro livestock. Another important policy piece is what's going on with our uh, economic development policy and um, work coming out of the Regional Prosperity Economic Development Plan 
And then continuing under the Lane Livability Consortium really focuses on the food and beverage cluster, which has become uh, well known as a key industry in this area and has helped to inform, in fact, the Envision Eugene piece um, in terms of the industrial jobs and land need associated with that. We have a couple other important pieces that, uh, that fill out the policy framework. The, cli the Community Climate and Energy Action Plan, which the mayor referenced, does speak directly to the food system on a couple of fronts. First, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from food. So it calls for reducing consumption of carbon intensive foods and reducing the greenhouse gas emission, excuse me, emissions associated with agriculture and food waste. It also addresses the notion- Give more detail on that, babe, what that means. Uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Would you like that now, or should we come back to that? Come back to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've got some more for. In terms of um, food security, the plan calls for increasing food security by preserving the productive capacity of local and regional food sheds. So it's in line with Envision Eugene in that regard. Preparing our food systems for the uncertainties created by climate change and rising energy prices and increasing the availability of homegrown and locally sourced food in Eugene. Another related piece and the final uh, segment of this, this policy review is the food security scoping and resource plan. This was something that uh, council directed staff to prepare in 2009 and it looks at multiple dimensions of food security. Uh, it called for addressing the barriers to urban agriculture and specifically micro livestock, something that you've since worked on and completing both an emergency food distribution plan and developing a full community f food security assessment. So now I want to turn to some of the best practices that um, actually form the framework of the um, training that Councillor Evans and I and others attended in Memphis back in September. These were the broad um, goals of that training, but it provides a nice framework for how to think about what we're doing here in the, in the region. So I'll just line those out for you. Understanding and assessing food systems, supporting urban agriculture, ensuring equitable access to healthy food choices, creating economic opportunity, and building more sustainable food systems. So I'll use that as a framework to, um, again, give you a very brief overview of some of the things that are going on here in our region. In terms of assessing food systems, the, the notion there is that uh, you create a baseline measurement of the existing food system with associated metrics. And a number of our regional partners are collecting those kinds of metrics, things like obesity rates, access to stores that provide healthy foods, school lunch eligibility among children, number of farms in the region, ag sector wages. There's a whole list of potential metrics that help to define the health of our, our local food system. The Sustainability Commission conducted a review in 2012, and that was one of the um, items that we included with your meeting materials today. They produced a memo to Council with some recommendations after a broad review of the food system. They were looking at several themes, including expanding access to markets, increasing access to land for production, improving and expediting access to processing sites, providing access to capital, ensuring equal access to public transportation, enhancing food security, and engaging in and expanding regional initiatives. So that was kind of a broad set of themes that came out of their work, but specifically in the memo to you, they called for some um, action items for immediate action, including creating a larger and more accessible seasonal farmer's market in Eugene, uh, in implementing Envision Eugene to update the land use code to facilitate the siting of food processing facilities. And finally, creating a food <coughs> policy task force to make recommendations regarding feasible policies and actions to enhance our local food economy and security. Other best practices to point out, uh, in terms of supporting urban agriculture, I mentioned this uh, just a moment ago, you took action back in February to adopt a local ordinance to um, promote micro livestock. And specifically, that ordinance increased the number of allowable chickens and domestic fowl and allowed rabbits, miniature pigs, and miniature goats within the city. Another important piece of the urban ag uh, 
opportunity here in Eugene is our system of community gardens. We've got a total of six community gardens with a, uh, 329 different plots. Those are typically allocated through a lottery system. And there are charges associated with those. Um, a smaller plot of about 200 square feet uh, cost $60 a year to, to have access to. And the larger plot of 400 square feet is $100. So I mentioned that there's a lottery for these. I um, was curious to learn that for the first time in about a decade, there was actually no waiting list this past year in uh, allocating those plots. They actually didn't have as many people as plots, which was the first time in a long time. So, so th that's a, a well-subscribed program. With regard to human and health and human services, um, those are typically outside the purview of the city, so I'll point to a number of initiatives that local partners are involved in. The Healthy Corner Store Initiative, which is a, a run through a partnership with Elche and Dairy Mart to make more healthy choices available in some of our local convenience stores. We have a number of uh, local organizations working on food rescue, and by that I mean collecting and making available edible food that might otherwise go to waste. So we've got Food for Lane County, Eugene Area Gleaners, and others working in that area. And then finally, I'd point to the Farm to School program uh, that's run by the Willamette Farm and Food Coalition, which works to link local farmers to area schools. All right, some other best practices. We've got a lot, a lot to share. In terms of economic opportunity, there's a lot going on here. I'll just give some, some highlights. I mentioned that the food and beverage cluster has uh, emerged as a very important industry in the region. And that work has continued under um, the leadership of both Lane County and the city of Eugene, uh, which put together a regional foods consortium to advance a number of, of um, initiatives, including one that will focus on the workforce, also on food distribution, and finally marketing and branding. In fact, some, there's been some recent development with that marketing branding effort. Um, some other things that uh, I would point to in terms of economic development in our region, you've heard about Sprout, the local food hub that's in Springfield. That's the work of NEDCO. It provides a year-round farmer's market, hatch a food business incubator, and a 3,000 square foot commercial kitchen for businesses in need of additional production capacity. In terms of sustainable food systems, we've got a few things um, to point to here in the city. Uh, you may have heard of Love Food Not Waste, our uh, program to collect and compost food waste that's coming out of local businesses, particularly grocery stores and restaurants. It helps to keep food out of the landfill and reduce the associated greenhouse gas emissions uh, from food disposal. The other initiative that I uh, want to mention to you is this multi-hazard risk assessment. This is something that was also called for in our uh, Community Climate and Energy Action Plan. It's a, an initiative that's currently underway to look at a combined set of risks, including natural hazards, climate change, and rising energy prices. So through uh, a risk assessment process, we're bringing all those risks together and evaluating our major systems in the community for vulnerabilities to those risks. So we're looking at things like our drinking water system, our transportation system, our electricity system, and yes, food system will also be a part of that assessment. So I know that was uh, the greatest hits of food policy in the region, but I just want to leave you with a few thoughts as you think about our food system. I think it's pretty obvious it's a very complex system with multiple, multiple dimensions and it's serving multiple functions. I've presented just a very simplified, simplified overview of that. The system should be viewed at the regional scale uh, with the city as just one of the multiple partners that has a role to play. It's important to maintain the alignment of priorities and metrics so all of these partners that you're learning about are working toward a set of shared goals and outcomes. And finally, using a triple bottom line approach <coughs> will promote holistic thinking about our food system that accounts for environmental health, social equity, and economic prosperity. I'll turn it over to Councillor Evans. All right. Thanks, babe. Um, I want to kind of call your attention first and foremost to a memo that I passed around. I didn't have a chance to distributed to you via email, but I will later after the uh, meeting and get that out to you on email as well as in hard copy. But this is just kind of a summary of the 
uh, Sustainable Communities Leadership Academy that six of us attended, including Babe, Claire Seguin, uh, I saw Lynn around here, so Lynn's back over here, Lynn Fessenden, uh, Bill Ellis from uh, Economic Development, and um, Sarah Majeski from uh, Lane County Economic Development. So the six of us uh, attended this conference. Babe was out a little, little in front of us uh, doing some pre-conference work and was really key to setting up the conference and working with um, the conveners of the conference, which um, is the you know Sustainability Communities Leadership Academy. Um, and the, the theme for the conference was urban agriculture and sustainable food systems. Uh, we basically covered a series of topics. It was a three-day um, workshop, if you will, slash conference in which we had various breakout sessions. And I won't go all, over all of those that are here in the memo, but to kind of highlight uh, some of the you know, broader themes. So the plenary session topics, for example, the first plenary session was about a road, to, a road map for city food sector innovation and investment. Uh, second session was focused on planning communities as if people eat. Um, <laughs> food philosophy uh, was the third one uh, with a colon there, uh, sustainable initiatives at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. So we had a presentation at lunch. I believe it was the second day from the chef of uh, St. Jude's, which was extremely engaging and very powerful. Uh, this is the most charismatic chef I've ever met in my <laughs> life. Uh, but the things that St. Jude's is doing in terms of urban farming, uh, micro, um, uh, you know, development of, of, of animals and, and, you know, the kinds of things that they do in terms of uh, working with their food system and the food that they serve at the hospital is really incredible. Um, so if you get a chance to hit St. Jude's website, I think that you can click over and see some of the things that he was able to uh, do in the program that he's put together over the last few years. It's absolutely amazing and phenomenal. Um, I, I attended uh, three breakout sessions, um, zoning for agriculture, urban, zoning for urban agriculture, I'm sorry. Um, also, I attended the uh, supporting urban agriculture, addressing land access, ownership, and, contamin and contamination. And my second one there was uh, training programs that engage youth and underrepresented communities. Um, I want to move to the back side of the memo, which are the key takeaways. What you'll see, uh, the key takeaways that, came, that I got from the conference, and I think um, uh, Babe and I kind of conspired on this a little bit to kind of make sure that we were in alignment. Um, I want to kind of address those and then come back around and talk about uh, where we are specifically as it relates to the presentation that we've had mm -hmm. and some of the holes that we can fill in and also what the Sustainability Commission has been advocating for over a year now uh, in terms of developing a comprehensive, not just a comprehensive vision, but uh, bolstering our strategic uh, position in terms of um, you know, urban agriculture and uh, the whole industry, the farm industry, the farm and food industry that um, I think that there's some significant opportunities we should capture. So in terms of economic development, key takeaways, uh, development of an integrated regional economic development strategy, we have pieces of that in place right now. Uh, leading us in terms of that is uh, Lane County's economic development program. I'm going to pass around to you there. Um, great sophisticated marketing brochure, but um, I don't think there's a lot of embellishment here, but it's really dressed up really nice. So I'm going to pass <laughs> that that way. Um, creating and, advan and advancing an urban agriculture business incubator. Um, that's something that is, we've been talking about off and on uh, for a little while now. And um, in my own 
neck of the woods in my own business. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about that with LCC around how we can develop a business incubator, help teach people who want to engage in urban farming how to do the business of urban farming and help them advance uh, their goals for their own private businesses and, and in some cases co-ops. Um, creating a viable, econo viable economic incentives for and, and identifying regulatory roadblocks, which um, Babe just mentioned for, for food production and distribution. If there are statutory roadblocks that the city in concert with the county and say Springfield can remove, that's something that we want to do. And we want to be able to facilitate as much as we can the development of this industry in our region. And you have to forgive me, I'm taking some medicine that's trying out my mouth, so. I'm not as fluid as I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the second area is vision and planning. Um, and going back again, key takeaways, uh, the creation of a comprehensive urban farming and food security vision for the region, incorporating the entire food chain, which is, again, underscoring what BAPE has just talked about. I believe that we have a food council. I know that Lynn was on the food council that we have. I'm not sure exactly where we are in terms of um, energizing that and moving that forward, but uh, maybe at some point I'll call on you to rescue me there a little bit, Lynn. Uh, but Sean Bowles and I had talked about that a little bit as well, and um, kind of getting that up from a regional perspective, um, getting the city involved in a significant way and moving the agenda forward and making sure that all of our efforts are in alignment with each other. Um, second bullet is developing a strategic plan with a triple bottom line assessment and evaluation tool as a guide for policy and strategic alignment. Example I'll call out is uh, the Vermont's 10-year uh, plant to farm to plate plan and of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. And if you go on their website, um, you can see a really well-developed, sophisticated plan of action that they have that they are currently implementing. And it's really, you know, it, it's very impressive, very exciting stuff. Um, and then, you know, basically restart our, food, our, our, our regional food council or and reinvigorate it and, and get more involvement there. And the last last uh, heading is access and equity, uh, creating training programs for youth and underrepresented communities. Um, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, we have poverty issues in our community. And some of those poverty issues can be clearly defined by regions of the city. One of the things that I want to see us do, and I see some of my folks from Bethel out there too, is to really address some of the critical poverty issues that we have going in Bethel and in other parts of the city, some in, in Whitaker, uh, so that we can you know, begin to raise the quality of life of folks and give them the tools to empower themselves. And this is a great tool to empower yourself by you know, creating your own um, uh, urban farm and, you know, uh, integrating yourself in various parts of the food chain, uh, which is maybe a little bit easier ramp up than, you know, starting your own brewery or something. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's things that people can do out of their gardens, out of their homes, out of their backyards um, that um, will lead to some self-sufficiency, if not in terms of making a lot of money, but at least feeding yourself, your family, and your neighbors. Um, which I think is critically important. Um, developing a system for home occupation, licensing for food production, um, and then reshaping zoning regulations to enhance food development strategies. So with all of that, I'll kind of close my presentation. Um, there's a couple of handouts that I'm going to send around. And so what I want to do is give you kind of an overview 
Um, these are things that I picked up at the conference. Um, the Regional Food Policy Council document and the uh, subsequent plan that uh, Puget Sound has, and they were there as well. I picked up a number of things from St. Louis, um, including uh, their branding is Gateway Greening. So as you know, the gateway to the west is the St. Louis Arch, and they've kind of, uh, you know, taken off on that and done some very uh, interesting things. One of the workshops I attended was about um, working with underrepresented communities and youth and some of the really um, interesting things that they are doing right now uh, with those communities. And um, the last thing is this, and I'll center around the economic development piece from Lane County as well, because Sarah did it already. Oh, I did it. Okay, it just it just rotated back to me. That was yeah. the second lap. And the second lap. And so the last piece that I'm going to um, uh, move around the table is this: uh, our friends to the north, uh, Damascus, Oregon, uh, recently put together a food plan. And uh, I happened to run into this just by coincidence because I serve on another board with uh, Elise Schlonick, who was the um, uh, project manager for this plan. And um, this is really some excellent stuff. Um, I would like to see us kind of maybe model this uh, for our community and really start um, uh, taking this a, a little more seriously in terms of ramping up our involvement in our efforts and doing the things that we can do as a city, as a city council, to uh, jumpstart us in a variety of areas here. So I'll pass this around as well. And I believe I gave um, jump drive to the mayor uh, from a conference that we had in Memphis, which is uh, – full of case studies and other research uh, that, you know, really kind of uh, gives an excellent backdrop uh, for things that we could do. So in other words, we already have invented pieces of the wheel here, and there are other pieces that we don't need to reinvent that we can model uh, from other communities. And I think that we can have a very um, exciting, robust program in a very short period of time. And so with that, I'll close my part of the presentation and turn it back to the mayor. Great. Anything else you need to say, babe? No, I would just add that I've got a hard copy of the resource guide that came out of our training in Memphis, which I'm happy to make available to anybody who wants to see it. Well, I just want to say thank you both for your presentation. I feel um, really fortunate to have um, the Sustainability Commission that's so interested in this, all the work that's being done by our partners throughout the community. Um, we got Claire over here who is engaged in it in her work life, and Greg has a high interest in taking the initiative to go to this conference and things. So I think we're we're well served. A small comment I want to make because you learn by your experience. So when I first came on as mayor and we were taking up the sustainability issue, one of the things that happened is people felt like um, they had been doing a lot of work already, and they felt that when I first mentioned it, I was being critical of what was already going on, which I didn't intend at all. But I think it's something for us to be careful of as we move forward, that the, um, the best thing we can do is admire and encourage all the work that's gone on in the community and then build on that because the reason we have the potential to do so much is because so much is already going on. And so I just want to say as we, as we move forward with this, let's be very careful to acknowledge all the good work that's going on uh, right now with all of our many partners that are engaged in this in a very serious way. I know even over in the Bethel School District, they are so uh, dedicated to trying to get, want to get um, healthy food into the uh, to kids in the school district and to uh, get good food near schools and less of the not so good food near schools. So there, it, there's just a lot of 
deep concern, and, and many of us have been to schools where the kids are growing their own gardens and using the, pro the produce out of their gardens in the, for their lunches at school. So there's just a t tremendous amount of stuff going on and making our community aware of what's there and what, what we can build on, I think, is a, is a huge uh, portion of this. And in November, right, the regional prosperity, the um, work we're going to be doing with that, we already know that the food cluster is a significant one for us. So taking this information that you brought back and the information that we've been working on and really um, capitalizing on what we already have going here in terms of that will be a, a really important part of the work that we try to do at our, um, our economic summit. So that this is just a good um, preface to the work that's ahead of us for doing this. So just appreciate it very much. I'm looking around. Comments? Yes. Chris? Great presentation. I'm really impressed with what you got out of the conference and, and the work you've done so far. Um, I, I think, you know, food is one of those fundamentals um, that is um, uh, a part of what, uh, you know, every community was founded around and what it needs to do. And I'm, I, I just kept tracking on when we first worked on transplant back in the 80s, way back. Um, it was kind of approached as there was the physical infrastructure side and then there was the demand management behavioral side. There's enormous numbers of parallels between transportation as a, um, a provided and food as a provided and, and the degree to which we can balance the infrastructure part of providing food, whether it's gardens, whether <coughs> it's programs, whether it's corner markets, wh whatever we can do physically to enhance that. Uh, I agree, we need to figure out how we can be engaged in that. The other whole side of it then is the demand management or the behavior side. And I know when we talked about um, <coughs> obesity, we talked about health, we talked about a whole number of different areas that food behavior has an enormous impact on, you begin to see that even a little bit of tweaking on the behavior side with food can have a tremendous impact rolling down in terms of health care costs, uh, physical costs, um, uh, you know, a whole variety of different things that can be influenced by it. So uh, the degree to which the city, and this is maybe a more delicate thing to consider is, what is the degree to which the city can be engaged on the behavior side so that it doesn't become inappropriate but still acknowledges the fact that at least um, for the short and moderate term um, and even in the long term, uh, I think behavior is an extremely important element of the whole picture of how we manage and sustain food. So you can grow it, we can create community gardens, you can do the infrastructure parts, um, but what is the appropriate role for the city in terms of how we can improve the behavioral side as well? Um, I think that double approach can net us the same benefits as they did with transportation planning. Um, you can plan for 10 years out, but you've got to do demand management to ensure that you can still maintain as you go along. Many parallels, but the same kind of logic, I think, could work really well for us. Claire, you're next. Great. Thanks, Chris. That's good stuff. Kind of stealing some of my thunder. I, I, I wasn't actually going to talk about that specific aspect of it. Um, I was thinking more about uh, availability and access, and um, I really appreciate the mayor's comments about acknowledging that there's been lots of excellent work happening in the community without any real strong involvement by the city. Um, so I think anything we do needs to enhance and support and grow that good work that's already out there. And um, Bethel School District, uh, it, as another uh, public agency, I think has shown real leadership um, in their, that way as well in many aspects of how they're uh, creating access to healthier food within their school environment. And I think the other thing, kind of building on what uh, Chris said, you know, I, as I have come onto this body and, and seen how we work, you know, I realize we, we plan for the things that we want to see happen. And so if we really want to see um, a strong, sustainable local food environment uh, with uh, healthy uh, access um, to food, we're going to need to plan for that. Um, so I really appreciate the work of the Sustainability Commission. Um, and I also, but I think it's also very challenging because on one hand we have local food and beverages producers that are distributing nationally, maybe even internationally, and that's a real uh, sound economic driver and something that can't be outsourced to another community. And on the other hand, we also need to, I think, support uh, smaller, local, hyper-local even access, um, whether it's in an economic context or folks growing their food for themselves. So there's a lot of 
variation within this landscape. So sometimes wrapping your head around it um, from this seat can be challenging in terms of how we do that. So I guess one question I would have for the city manager is, where do we see this kind of work living within the city? Is it, is it really within the Sustainability Commission or does um, economic development get involved and how much thought have we had a chance to do around that piece? Uh, probably any and all of that. Uh, obviously, as Babe mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of it ties back to Envision Eugene, which is not purely a planning exercise, it's a citywide exercise. And so I think it rests uh, in all of those. Part of it is an economic development piece of it. Some of it is a uh, food security risk assessment piece of that, which is uh, falls differently than uh, what we think about in the economic development or planning side. And so from our perspective, it, it will play out in uh, multiple places. The Love Food Not Waste is really sits with Ethan Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, which is in a, in a different place. And so... Um, <clears throat> The, the positive part of it is that uh, everybody can play and should play as opposed to uh, picturing it in one or uh, two places which then it, it allows the rest of us to escape accountability. Uh, it's easier if in fact it becomes a multiple, multifaceted which then everybody has some commitment and accountability to them. So. Great, I'm glad to hear that. And then I, but my worry is that then there might be disparate things happening and, and wanting to make sure things are coordinated and, and people know what's happening in different aspects of the of city infrastructure in terms of that support. Um, uh, I think that, I, well, I guess my other comment would be then as we, build this work and think about how the city is involved and then reaching out to other government agencies like the school districts and uh, building on the, the good work that, that, for example, Bethel has done and seeing if we can bring 4J uh, along a little bit further than they are now, in my opinion, um, I think would be very important too in terms of thinking regionally or even just within the context of the city. So I'd like to see some of that, those conversations initiated as well as we are able. And thank you very much for the great report and work. Mike? Mayor, can I get in the queue? Surely. Thank you, Mayor. I really appreciate this discussion. I appreciate the report, and I agree with the comments. Um, very important subject. And it, I, I appreciate the scope of the conversation, but it, it's, it's very broad and lives in a lot of places. But um, I think that it touches so many other things that are important for us to deal with from health care related issues to educational issues to certainly economic development issues. Um, I'm kind of left kind of searching around for what's our appropriate role to participate, you know, and what can we do to make it better locally. Um, I'm certainly not one that is ever much of a cheerleader for a, an overly robust regulatory environment, <laughs> one could say. Um, but in this particular case, there's an issue around that for me. Um, I brought it up during the course of the Sustainability Commission's report, and I'd like us to talk about it a little more. There's a, Whenever you talk about agriculture, be it urban or otherwise, there's a weak link issue that doesn't get, in my opinion, as much conversation, and it's bees. Um, there's a lot of conversation around it colony collapse and some of those issues and I uh, asked about it but haven't really followed up to get as much information as I would like to have but I think we should talk about the appropriate level of regulation around neonicotinoids and things that affect the health of our partner in that process so I don't know where that lives in staff work but I sure for one would like to have more information on I mean because even up in Woodburn they had a big die off and under the, those circumstances I'd like to know what we should be doing that's intelligent and, and appropriate so the manager wants to answer that question uh, that specifically I think the broader question of sort of the involvement of the elected <laughs> officials uh, that particular conversation um, uh, I suspect will come up in the conversation about integrated pest management, which is a work session that will be coming up as uh, that Claire had asked that we continue that conversation. So that, I think, more specifically, we'll talk a little bit about bees itself. But I think with respect to where the council is involved, I think the council has been involved in a variety of places of 
of setting policy, and I suspect there'll be more places to come up out of some of the economic development discussions, out of some of the stuff that Greg and Babe have been around. But, and I'll go back to Envision Eugene, you have set some policy dis direction with that uh, work so far, which does impact these conversations. Uh, if we think about River Road in Santa Clara, yeah. there's a, an opportunity where the council will be uh, providing some policy direction around urban agriculture, because as you know, part of what uh, makes River Road Santa Clara such an appealing place for people yeah, yeah. is a little bit of that rural urban agricultural yeah. Yeah. kind of feel transition. And so as uh, as the communities out there continue to create a vision, and, and that's part of Envision Eugene, that will be some policy direction that the council will provide. So I think you have been and will continue to provide direction around a lot of these things, and there'll be additional opportunities through some of the work of Greg and Babe and even uh, some more specific things on with bees more specifically. Well, I think all of us should be cheerleaders for this. I know at least to some degree or other, everybody at the table enjoys growing some of their own things too, so I think we can all be good cheerleaders for that as well. Alan, you're next. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank Babe and Greg for an excellent presentation. Greg, uh, on the webcast and phone, you came across as smooth and fluid, so I wanted to let you know that. <laughs> Smoothie. <laughs> and knowledgeable, uh, both of you. Uh, this is a really important issue, I think, for three reasons. Uh, food security is an issue that we should be concerned about. It is an economic development uh, tool for us, the food group. And promoting that in our in our local economy is is uh, an important part of where we should be looking for new jobs and economic development. And there's an enormous amount of public interest in this. Um, it's a national issue. Uh, I'm down in Los Angeles, and the, and just yesterday on the news they had a Los Angeles city councilor uh, propose an ordinance that would allow LA folks to use the median strips for. Uh, for gardens and fruit and nut trees, which has uh, so far been uh, illegal to do. Um, and so it's, it's happening everywhere. Uh, the food security goal in particular was, was a goal that bubbled up from the public at the Sustainability Commission when we were hearing from folks, and that was the conduit through the Sustainability Commission and how it got to us. And it was one that wasn't on our, on our radar, really, uh, but the public put it on the radar, and it became one of our four goals, sustainability goals, that the council unanimously supported. And that goal was to have a food security plan. Uh, but that, uh, and the Sustainability Commission has been working on this, but the but it's been kind of uh, stalled for a while. In the packet is a letter from the Sustainability Commission on this particular topic dated May 29, 2012, over a year ago that uh, n that the Sustainability Commission never got a response to about this issue. And uh, it mentioned a lot of things that we've been talking about and that Babe and Greg were talking about, but in particular it mentioned three things that we should focus on for immediate action, which was, one, to work with the public and private partners to create large, larger and more accessible seasonal farmer markets. Uh, Two, during the implementation phase of a Envision Eugene, update the land use code to facilitate siting of food processing facilities from an economic development perspective. And three, request that the mayor appoint a time-limited food policy task force to make recommendations regarding feasible, feasible policies and actions to enhance local food economy and security with special attention to mapping urban food site opportunities, utilizing partnerships to enhance community garden activity, and review policies uh, that are included in attachment A, which is an appendix to a long laundry list of different actions that can happen. I think that uh, they deserve a response from the council and the mayor, uh, and, and not just yes, but how we would do this. Uh, you want another round, Alan? Installed. Yes, please. George Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, guys, for the presentation. Um, appreciate that. I just kind of want to. I just see an enormous contradiction here reading through all this material and listening to the presentations. Uh, you know, urban farming, food security, we're, we're, you know, trying to increase both of those uh, 
enhance the ability to do both those things, and then we attend an Envision Eugene meeting, and we consider annexing into the urban growth boundary Clear Lake Road and plopping down factories and subdivisions and paving over all these class one and two soils. And it's like, what, what, so what, <laughs> that, you know, if we did that, that, that really seriously diminishes any ability to address food security in any meaningful way. So, I mean, I realize that, you know, sometimes our goals do conflict and that happens and you have to try to work that out. So I'm just wondering, I, I don't know what the solution is. My solution is don't annex it and keep it as farmland, you know. That's that's what I would say, but um, so you know if we if we if we do that and then run around and talk about food security, it's like it, it's it's almost meaningless if you if you have policies that that work directly against that. So I, this is more of a comment than I'm, I'm not proposing any solution to that contradiction here now. But it just that just leaped out at me listening to the presentation and reading this material. Thanks. Uh, Betty? Thank you. <coughs> George just stole part of what I wanted to say. <laughs> he looked at my notes. <coughs> kidding. Um, oh, that's, I think that's really important that we, um, a part of the vision, Eugene, that really disturbs me is a part about expanding the urban growth boundary. I think we need to go back and change the ratio of multifamily to single family zoning and that's a really important step. Um, I agree that economically things related to food are really a good, good way to go. Food and the arts those are t and education, those are three of the big things we have here I think, the assets we have. And if we're encouraging any kind of business uh, things related to those are far superior to call centers, for example. Um, I, <coughs> farmer's market is one of the very best things we have in town. There was just an expert here talking to some of the staff and to City Club about um, design and livable cities and so forth. and. Um, he, I asked him to go look at the farmer's market, which is probably the best thing in Eugene. Uh, but I'm concerned that, talking about um, working in contrary ways, people are getting tickets for parking to go to the farmer's market all the time. People are waiting to give them tickets one minute before their time expires. And I think we need more space for the farmer's market. We also need to make it free to park around it on Saturdays at least. Um, of course, I favor that this one place that Mike and I agree as I have, I have um, free parking. I think there should be <coughs> free parking everywhere, and there should be free bus passes passed out by employers. Um, Had me for a while. The bees, yeah. I, <laughs> just, just take what you can get. <laughs> the, I agree that bees are are very important, but as I mentioned at a previous meeting, they're doing her herbicides in. Um, Hendricks Park right now, and I don't know whether the bees get down there or not, but they probably do um, if there's a bloom down there, and so we shouldn't, we should be careful about that. Um, fences, I've asked for, for a work session on fences, and that is related to this topic. A person who wanted, said that we don't allow tall fences in front yards, and this one person said, why can't we at least have a see-through fence to protect a garden from the deer? And I think that is related. If you want to grow food, you need some protection because the deer, they have a right to eat too, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, <laughs> uh, quit using up all the land where they live. That's what to do about the deer. Um, Thank you. Oh, I, I have one more thing. I'm just looking. Uh, two seconds. Over. <laughs> <laughs> You can sign up for another round if you want. How long. Okay. Just playing our game. Right, another time. <laughs> Put me down again. Okay. I just want to say one more thing. So just a couple <laughs> things, uh, comments I would like to uh, point out is that the city was very involved some years back in sort of the scoping of the food, uh, what's out there. We were sort of on the ground floor of working with people in the community to do that kind of scoping, and that happened. I can't remember if that happened before the climate and energy plan or 
uh, around that. It was time. about the same time, actually. About the same time. So, uh, been working pretty steadily at that. I would also point out that we've seen a plethora of farmers markets pop up all over the place. Springfield has a new one. We have them in various places around the community. So there's been a lot of activity around growth of farmers markets. And in terms of um, the system, the other thing I want to point out, the incubator for agriculture, that was the intention of Hummingbird. Mm -hmm. And that's what why they built their facility to be that kind of incubator place and they are part of the seed and bean and grain project right and um, and the whole intention of that has been as uh, grass seed has been going uh, becoming a less viable product it's being replaced with uh, red winter wheat and teff and some other products that uh, and so and then uh, some local farmers have been engaged with the uh, hummingbird folks and other folks and taking and processing those they built a mill over on Prairie Road to do that so there's been a really a whole lot of um, exciting innovative things not to say that we're anywhere near where we could be but there are just a ton of really um, incredible amount of work that people have been doing in our in our broader um, community and then I've had a lot of mail about uh, edible parks and they have um, um, Seattle's done some work on on that and I think we have some work on that I think, think several of our parks uh, as, as uh, neighborhoods have been engaged and they want to have uh, fruit and nut trees in um, in parks but it's something to to think about in addition to community gardens there are other kinds of ways to put more edible products out there for people in in the community so and I know that uh, Jan Spencer for instance has been involved in uh, reestablishing a, a whole filbert orchard out of, on uh, out there in River Road so it's just a, a lot of a lot of things that I think people aren't aware of that are happening all over the place right now and, and I think our job is to in the case of Hummingbird and Glory B, we're uh, our low interest loans help them um, grow those businesses that are part of the uh, of the food sector. So, if uh, if Babe or anyone else wanted to do a little bit more uh, deep look at how the city's been engaged, so that everybody would know how the city's been engaged in this over the last few years, that uh, we we certainly aren't everything, but we certainly have a significant piece in what's been going on. Um, second round is Claire, you're up. Thanks. So, uh, thinking about some of the suggestions from counselors and looking at the recommendations in the um, letter from May 2012, um, it seems like there would be some consideration for code changes um, or other things that we've been doing within the Envision Eugene <coughs> process for part of, of what we're planning for, but we haven't taken up these uh, recommendations in any in any deep way. And so I'd like to know what would be the process for taking those next steps and starting to look more at specific uh, potential code changes that we could consider to support the goals that we want. Um, let me get back to you on that. I don't know uh, from the planners and others' perspectives of what it takes to do that. So let me... Um, we'll get back to you and let you know what the um, tracks for that could be. Okay. Because, uh, you know, one of the things I see in here is, you know, the creation of an enterprise zone for fruit, food production. Um, something that was mentioned in the article over the weekend about the Santa Clara Community Park lands was the idea of potentially leasing that out as urban agriculture until the city was in a position to actually develop a park there. So. Um, I'd like for us to be considering those kinds of um, options. It you know gives us a chance to make use of something that right now is a nice open field, but um, not really uh, adding a ton of value to the city. Um, and then there's the challenge that some of the regulation is out of our jurisdiction. So <coughs> Lane County is responsible for, my understanding is, licensing you know, food carts, for example, and making sure that they're meeting um, health and safety and how they work. Um, so I don't know if Babe or uh, someone else could speak to how we might intersect or kind of catalog where where our jurisdiction would stop and and we'd have to uh, ask other agencies for some accommodation or 
reconsideration. Uh, we'd have to get back to you on that as well. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, we don't know that at the moment. So. Okay. Um, because the, I think somewhere that's, you know, we can grow a lot of food, but if we can't do anything with it, then it, it becomes kind of a moot point. And I think government has a big role to play. And it may not just be the city government, it may even go all the way up to state and fed. So I think we need to be thinking about those things as we go forward. Ellen? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, the, the fact that we have a, a letter that we didn't respond to that goes all the way past a year back in May 2012, is, 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 this issue's kind of stalled, and I think this is a, the, the uh, it's been reinvigorated by the Institute for Sustainable Communities and the Sustainable Community Leadership Academy thing that Greg and uh, Babe uh, and others went to uh, in Memphis in September. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's appropriate for the Sustainability Commission to continue to work on this topic along with the staff, Ethan, and, and, and folks that work with him. Um, I think that with specifically to the goal, one of the four goals that we adopted as a council called for a food security plan, and that's really gone nowhere. I think, uh, it, well, it started and it's gotten a little bit uh, movement, but it, it ha we haven't seen much work on that. I think directing the city manager to move that forward when we're able to do that with staff time would be a good thing to do. Uh, I know there's been lots of more important things on, on city staff's plate than that, which is why it's been pushed off. But the thing that Claire was talking about, the three items that the Sustainability Commission brought forward, uh, I think they did the work of synthesizing this for us, which is uh, in, in capsulized in these three items. So. I, I think that we should have uh, Ethan and the staff and the Sustainability C Commission work with partners on a farmer's market, um, and we should ask staff, like uh, Claire was talking about, how to facilitate siting and processing of, of uh, food processing facilities within Vision Eugene and what code changes might enhance that and other types of food issues. And then um, I, I, I like the idea of the mayor appointing a short term, not a standing committee, but a food policy task force that brings attention that can work on these three different items that are uh, noted. At, at least these are a little bit bigger, but I think right now there's a lot of good momentum uh, to get that off the ground, and, and people are very interested in it. I don't think you have any problem at all populating it. I think we'd have a little bit of problem staffing it and making sure it gets um, uh, done well, but uh, I, I think we should move forward on all of those things. Greg, you're next. Um, thanks, Mayor. I'd like to uh, echo a little bit of what um, Alan has just said, but also to address uh, Councilor Brown's point um, around Clear Lake and the inventory of uh, industrial lands. One of the things I want us to remind us is that um, even as Eugene is not a done deal, we are going to have a series of conversations coming up very shortly to discuss Envision Eugene, and I see us as having the opportunity to tweak that document um, and to be able to maybe rethink some policy recommendations that may or may not fit with what we envision as the appropriate land use for that area and for other areas of the city as well. Uh, the second thing is, is one of the things I've missed in the presentation was to talk about brownfield development. There's some really interesting things going on around the country, most notably in my hometown of Cleveland, where there's large swaths, swaths of abandoned vacant land and houses that are being knocked down. They're being reclaimed, uh, some of which are brownfield um, areas, and that the technology exists to cover some of those uh, pieces of land be able to put new soil on top of it and be able to grow uh, foods as well as other things that we are looking at, flowers and a variety of things on, on top of that. And I think they have a very robust program going on right now with that. And then the last thing, and going back to Alan's point, is, is that, um, you know, one of those recommendations, recommendation three, which is an IAS, you know, talk specifically about 
the creation of the task force um, and the charge of what that task force would be. And I think it's, it's, it's more in the area of creating synergy regionally, uh, developing alignment of policies, which means that we're work, working cross-jurisdictionally with our friends at Lane County and Springfield to, you know, make sure that our um, policies are in alignment and make sense for the entire region. Um, and then also, you know, adopting a food security policy, which I think we're lagging behind on significantly. So those are the things I wanted to underscore and point out. Betty? Thank you. Um, Greg just reminded me of something that I have mentioned previously, which is <clears throat> why couldn't we use temporarily vacant city on land for gardens? It's done in Germ it was started in Germany, I think we've done many places in Europe that if there's land that belongs to the public and is not yet being used, people can have it for gardens to grow food and flowers. Usually they, they sometimes even put in decorations or statuary or something to make it beautiful. And it's been a good thing for people who are hungry, also a good thing for immigrants to meet other people from their home country in, uh, in some places. And I think that's so if we have such a committee, I, I'm, I'm sort of opposed to proliferation of committees, but that's something that might be considered. Um, the other thing I wanted to say last time, though, is a more, a more negative thing. Um, I've had complaints about the livestock in, in the city and people who say, I moved to the city instead of the country because I wanted to live in the city. And I don't think anybody complains about vegetables growing next to them, but when it comes to goats and chickens, and then they look out in the backyard and see rats playing around, uh, they make a connection. So I, th I think that's, that there is a drawback. And I still think that people, if we're going to let people have goats, they should have a license for them. And I think I'm in the minority on that. But um, if my dog has to have a license, why shouldn't somebody else's goat? It's bigger than my dog, probably. Thank you. Just a couple comments. I wanted to call out that the neighborhood associations have really been working on um, sort of a flat emergency slash food security kind of issues with neighborhood associations around the city. And so some of that work has been underway. I know that you could get, uh, and we could probably get a memo for you on that. And I know that um, the, we've been doing a lot of work to try to um, grow the farmers market and, but it depends in part of course on what the farmers want to do and it also depends on what property we have for the expansion we've been working on trying to have a conversation about the butterfly lot for a long a long time and there are also issues between the Saturday market and the farmers market so that but I'm, I think you probably had memos on that, but we could get another one because I think I want you to know that that's been something that we've been really working on. And we had uh, got some funds for um, Brownfield study that we're engaged in, right, mm -hmm. city manager? So I wanted you to be sure that you knew that. Um, and then, of course, we did the garden at the federal courthouse that was there for two, seasons. two three years. Yep. That was exactly what um, uh, Councillor Taylor was referring to, which was using unused uh, space. So we have been involved in that. And, um, and then there are uh, some very successful gardens that are, I cannot remember the name of this. It's one of the Latino organizations that Huerta. has been. Huerto. Huerto. Familiar? Yeah, been, uh, and they've done some incredible work with, with gardens. So all of those items that you have mentioned, although not done everywhere, have been done in part in various places around the community. So we have a precedence for, for all of that work um, being underway. Keeping it going is another thing. <laughs> but, yeah. Great. Anybody else have a comment? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>